morning, everyone. Because we had a great day yesterday at the fair, and that was a good way to start a service. How blessed we are to have an inspired band who open our service in worship and who will lead us in worship this morning. As we gather, just a few announcements. And first of all, a reminder that we meet midweek every week on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. for prayer in the side chapel. You don't have to pray out loud, but it is a joy to gather with God's people to bring our needs and the needs of the whole world before Him in prayer. So drop in any Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Coming up this Thursday is Common Ground, which is our new community and space for those in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And Claire Jones, who's one of the team around organizing that, is going to come up and tell you a little bit more about what this first evening of Common Ground will look like. So if Claire's around, I'll invite her to come up and take the microphone now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And um, we're really looking forward to launching Common Ground on Thursday night. So it's aimed at 20, 30, and 40. Albeit when I'm leading it now, I'm sort of coming towards the end of that group of people. But anyhow, for now, I shall enjoy remaining in it. Um, on our first night, weather dependent, we may have barbecue if the sun shines, but there will be food and some food treats and supplies, so everyone's very welcome. Um, I'm delighted as our first speaker on, or on Thursday night to have Julia Henry. Julia went to school with me um, back in Danbridge Academy Day and has been a missionary in Ecuador since she graduated. And she's had an interesting journey during her time in Ecuador. So um, she's just come back now in Northern Ireland, probably as a temporary basis. So we really look forward to hearing what she has to say about how she served God out in Ecuador. So um, Kathy and I are around after church. If anyone has any questions, please come and chat to us. And we'd love to see as many of you there as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're really looking forward to the start of this. So be part of it and please do spread the word if you're able. Then Wednesday week, that's Wednesday the 26th of June, we have the first gathering of women together. They're having a pudding and planning night because how can you say no to pudding? Um, and it will also be an evening when they can plan what the year ahead will look like. So women together are meeting for the first time, but they will begin to meet more regularly as the year goes on. Um, so be part of women together, even in these initial stages of planning, by coming along on Wednesday the 26th of June at 7.30 p.m. in the hall. Then, looking a little farther ahead into the summer, our holiday Bible club is coming up here in Holy Trinity between the 12th and the 16th of August. Spaces are getting booked up quite quickly, so we want to make sure that if you're intending to come, that you book as soon as possible. So if you're very technological, you can scan that code, even if it's on screen now, and that will take you to the booking page. Um, or you can get in touch with the office, or find it on the website or Facebook, and you can book there. But please do spread the word. If you know people are intending to come along, then please book as soon as possible. We're really excited about it, and we need you to be praying for it. So if you're not going, and you don't have kids or grandkids who are going to go, then please do commit to praying for it, because that is a way, a really important way, that you can be part of it. Then, finally, our summer fair yesterday, God was so good to us. It rained first thing in the morning, and it rained after the last marquee had come in. And so the Lord blessed us indeed with good weather for the whole day. It was a great day for us as a church family, and a great day for the whole community as we were able to welcome them here to Holy Trinity. On the day itself, we raised 9,200 pounds, and I think that deserves a round of applause. Thank you so much to all those who were part of it. Many hands came together to make it possible, but a special thank you to our fair committee who have been working and making preparations and laying the groundwork for the day itself for many months before. And the fair committee especially wants to thank all the young people who were involved yesterday. They were so impressed by each and every young person who took a stand, who worked so hard all day, and so let's give them a very special round of applause. And our young people are pretty great because they're going to now lead us in worship. So as they come up to lead us in worship, shall we just pray together? Heavenly Father, we do give thanks for your love, mercy, and grace to us. And we pray, Lord, that we would realize those things more and more in our lives as we gather and meet to worship today. So Lord, bless us. Pour your spirit out afresh upon us that we might encounter afresh the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand and worship as we sing first, everyone needs compassion.
sit or kneel as we confess our sins to Almighty God. Let us pray. And together we pray, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate thought, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And together we pray as our Lord himself has taught us. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Again, as we worship God and sing our kids' songs. So, if there are any kids in church this morning who would like to show us how it's done, then you can come to the top of the steps now. We're singing Every Move I Make. And if there's any teenagers in church today who want to show the kids how it's done, then you can come and stand at the bottom of the steps to give them a hand. But to make it a little bit less scary, why don't we all stand together? We're singing Every Move I Make. So, if there's any energetic kids, maybe everyone's feeling a little tired, come on to the top of the steps. And teenagers will come and lead the actions anyway from the bottom of the steps. And if there's no willing kids and teenagers, you can come on up to the top of the set. <laughs> <laughs>
standing, we declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Um, Amy's going to come now to lead us in our prayers. And thank you, Amy. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, the giver of life, the maker of heaven and earth and everything in them, who reigns with power and unfailing love, we give thanks that the Lord is faithful to his people, who is gracious and compassionate. Is anger and nothing love. He knows us completely and yet he extends his endless love to us. Trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all his love. We pray that we would continually be people who surrender ourselves to Christ, accepting his love for us and faithfully seeking his everlasting kingdom, glorifying his majesty through our lives. Lord, in your mercy. God, the King of Righteousness, lead us in ways of justice and peace. As we look around our broken world, we despair over the injustice and suffering that is happening everywhere. We pray for their suffering as a result of war, persecution, poverty, or disaster, as we continue to fight for those in Ukraine and in Gaza. Lord, we pray that you would grant godly wisdom and discernment to all those in leadership and authority. Would they rule with compassion and justice? Lord, we pray that we would be a people who carry the heart of Christ wherever we go, that our hearts would break for the injustices that break yours. Lord, we know you are the God of justice and peace. We pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. God of peace, we pray for your church, that it may be filled with peace and love. We come before you this morning with great thanks for the gift of our church family. We pray for a deep unity. May our church family stand as a beacon of your love and love. Lord, we extend our gratitude for the leaders you have placed in our church family, for the ministry team within this church that are dedicated and humble in all that they do to guide each one of us in our spiritual journey. We pray for Willie Nixon as he continues to play the part in leading our church family. We pray that you would stand by her on him and help him to navigate all the changes that he and his family are facing upon this day. And we pray for ourselves and all disciples of Christ. May we seek your grace and guidance in all that we do. Lord, we pray, stir up in us a hunger for spiritual growth. May we have a new devotion to you and a passion for your name. May our lives radiate the joy that comes from knowing you. Lord, in your mercy. Well, today especially, we give our thanks to the fathers and father figures in our lives. Bless his name and serve as fathers and father figures in our, in our lives. And thank you for all that they do in this place. We pray for your strength and blessing. God of comfort, help us to share in this ministry of love as we serve and support one another. And bless all those in need of your loving embrace today. We pray for those who have been bereaved and those who are sick. And we pray for those who are stressed or heavy burdens at this time. In a moment of silence, we pray for ourselves and for these new beings. Lord, what peace will you give to these oppressive and blessed? We call upon you in our times of need with the knowledge and assurance that you give us the strength and will to bear our heavy burdens. Lord, in your mercy,
seated. Uh, Rory goes from violin to reading the Bible, and so please be seated for a Bible reading. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 4. Verse 4 through 25. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the truth. There, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of men, and so there was great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon, all the people. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and explained, "This man is the divine power." Known as the Great Power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed that it as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere. Astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed so that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that Peter was given was given at the laying on the on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, "Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit." Peter answered, "May your money perish with you." Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money, and you had no part to share in this ministry, because your heart was not right before God. Repent of his wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps He will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered. Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you will say may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word, the word of God to the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many cities, man, and villages. This is the word of the Lord. we dig into God's Word now, shall we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks for your Word, which speaks to us words of love, mercy, and grace, which gives to us words of encouragement and challenge. So we pray, come by your Spirit this day to speak afresh to us, that we might come alive in our love for you and in living for your greater glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On my very first school trip away from home in primary six to Cabra Tars, we all sat down on our second or third day there and were given the task of writing postcards to our family at home. We weren't, of course, actually all that far from home and we were only way away for a few days. I'm pretty sure my postcard home arrived after I had arrived back at home. But there was, at that time, something pretty exciting about writing it and sending it. It's the first piece of post that I can actually remember sending. You couldn't record 
very much on those small postcards, but you could give some highlights. And at age nine, the only highlights I wanted to give were the things that I knew would most scandalize my grandparents back at home. So I told them that I'd been covered in mud on the first day, that I got no sleep in my dorm room at all, that we were out at night with only torches, it was pitch black, there were no adults in sight, that kind of thing. Those are the things that made that trip memorable for me. They're the things that I can still talk about with people I went to primary school even today. They summed up for me everything that needed to be there to make a school trip great. And this is what we get from the early church in the book of Acts. Postcards from the early church is our new summer series, and here we're looking at some of the highlights of who and what the church should be and should do. As we read from the book of Acts, we're at a point in the history of God's people when Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, our King, He has come. He's died on the cross. He's risen again on the third day, and then He's ascended into heaven. But not before giving a great commission to his disciples, sending them out to continue his kingdom work in his name. At the very beginning of the book of Acts, just as he promised, God then sends the Holy Spirit on all who follow Jesus, the very presence of God dwelling within them and within us as followers of Jesus, to empower us and to equip us for this great commission from Jesus. And as God continues to work in and through the disciples of Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, we see throughout the book of Acts that the church of Jesus is growing and growing and growing. There wasn't going to be room to record everything that was happening because there was so much happening. But there were some highlights that needed to be recorded so that the church of Jesus Christ throughout all ages, even as we read these postcards, these snapshots, these highlights, so that we as the Church of Jesus Christ today would be reminded, would remember who we are, who we are called to be, and what, as the Church of Jesus Christ, we are called to do. We begin this journey of remembering today in order to be renewed, in order to be reformed, in order to be refashioned in the likeness of Jesus and in the way that He walks as our Savior, as the head of this body, in order that we work the way Jesus wants us to work. But some of us have gotten a head start on this journey through the book of Acts. Inspire has been studying the book of Acts for quite a while now. And as we set the scene today and get excited about what lies ahead, they have got plenty to teach us, to share with us, and some words of wisdom for us to get us excited. So I'm going to invite any Inspire people who would like to come and share with us about the book of Acts to come up now. You can tell us a bit about it. You can grab one of these microphones along here. Don't all leave at once. Which one is it? <laughs> they are excited about Acts, really, just not getting out of the seat. That's the hard part. What you love about the Book of Acts? What gets you excited about the Book of Acts? Um, so I chose um, two verses, and um, it was after Stephen had retold the story right through from Abraham to Moses, and um, he was saying how everyone, like Jesus, was that was hurt, like was crucified, and so many people that believed in God were crucified, not crucified, but persecuted because of their beliefs, and he was about to get stoned, and so verse 54 and 55 of chapter 7 say, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and I really like that because um, it reminds us that even, like, we shouldn't, like, fall into peer pressure. And when he knew he was going to get killed because of what he believed in, but he didn't just, he didn't deny it. He, like, stood for what he believed in, and I think we can learn something from that. So, yeah. Thank you. Olivia, what did you love about the Book of Acts, or what's been a thing that stood out to you of your time of studying the Book of Acts? Um, I liked chapter 10, and in chapter <laughs> in chapter 10, um, we meet this 
Gentile, and he was called Cornelius, and um, he was the first Gentile Christian. And I really think that's important for us because we are Gentiles, we are Jews, and it's just kind of about how he was told the story of Christ and um, how we should tell others about the story of Christ, not who, not not only other Christians and other and it had people from different um, beliefs and stuff. What have you got to share with us this morning? What do you love about the book of Acts? Um, so I did about Herod's death. Um, so it's just uh, about how um, he tried to be God, um, God-like, and he got punished for it. So an angel from uh, the Lord got sent down and struck him, and he got eaten by worms. <laughs> but it's just a nice reminder that you should follow the Ten Commandments the best you can, and try not to get eaten by worms. <laughs> I'm glad that's a nice reminder. It sets the tone very well. <laughs> um, so, Amy has actually been, you were in Greece, Amy, in April? So, Amy's just going to give us a little bit of an overview of the geographical lay of the land of the Book of Acts. She has a couple of slides as well, so she'll give um, Trevor and Colin a nod, which needs them to move, I guess. Um, so yeah, we went to Greece in April there, and one of the days we spent actually going into Thessaloniki and Philippi, um, which is, Thessaloniki is obviously where the book of Thessalonians is like written to the Thessaloniki people, <laughs> um, and then we went to Philippi to visit like um, where Paul actually did his ministry. So if you guys want to set up the first few slides there, these are some of the pictures we took, um, and if you go to the next one. So, oh, it's all went funny, but that's okay. Um, so, if we started off in Neapolis, which is where actually Paul, um, he harbored in, and that's where he started. So, it was really cool. We, we had a bit of a gap day. We were doing a mission team, so we decided that we would spend this day traveling, and we went there first thing um, at the beginning of our day, and we just sat where he harbored in. We actually did a Bible study, and it was so nice. Um, to to read exactly where the were where he started was where we were, um, and it was amazing to actually read exactly where we were. Um, go to the next one, please. Um, so then this was in Philippi. In Philippi, we visited Paul's prison, um, and we got to see the um, amphitheaters and actually walk the places that Paul would have been walking. We saw the marketplace, and it was just incredible. There was such a tangible presence of God there. So obvious that the whole place was so quiet, um, even though there were so many visitors. Like, I mean, there was groups of hundreds of people coming, and the place was silent. There was no one. Everyone was just taking it all in. Um, and I know it doesn't look busy there, which is kind of funny, because it really was. But, um, it was um, just amazing. And then we sat, actually, and we did another Bible study there, like devotional thing in the marketplace, which was so cool, because you were just reading from Acts, and you were like, we're actually here right now, this is crazy. Um, so then the next one, we then went to Lydia's River, which was um, just a bit further out on the way home, and there we just got to see, like, that's the place exactly where Lydia was baptized in Acts, um, and it was amazing as well, because you could, like, walk through the water, and we all did that, and just sat there for ages. Every place that you went to here had just had such a peace, and I think it is amazing now looking back because I can read Acts and I'm like, oh my goodness, I was there and I can picture all the places. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give me a round of applause. So, all of that doesn't get you excited about a summer series in the Book of Acts. I don't know what will. So, let's get stuck in. If you want to have your Bibles open, we're at Acts chapter 8 and we're beginning at verse 4. And in this chapter, we see that Acts is a book all about God at work in and through and for his people. His people, the new and now growing Church of Jesus Christ. As we look at this today, there's a macro and there's a micro context in which we see God at work. There's the big and the geographical, and there is the small and the personal. And from those contexts, we'll hear from Scripture a couple of ways in which we are spoken to afresh today. 
words of encouragement, words of, in- words of challenge, words that want to change and transform us to look more and more like Jesus and more and more like the church of Jesus Christ. So beginning in verse 4, we see God first at work in Samaria. Philip ends up in Samaria because there has been a great scattering of disciples of Jesus. Freya told us a little bit about that. There's been the death of Stephen, the first martyr, and then a great persecution has broken out against the early church. But this scattering of those early and first disciples only sees the beginning of the fulfillment of the words of commission spoken by Jesus. Jesus said that his disciples would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, where they have just left, in all Judea and Samaria, where Philip has just arrived, and then to the very ends of the earth. Even in this scattering and at this moment of persecution and fear, God is at work. So with confidence, confident that God is at work, even though circumstances are against them, with confidence, Philip goes to Samaria, proclaims the good news that Jesus is the promised Messiah, long awaited, long promised, long hoped for, and now come in the person of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, who has ascended into heaven, but who has gifted his people, his spirit, to dwell with them forever. And with the signs of the kingdom that Jesus brings, impure spirits cast out, and the healing of those who are paralyzed or lame, with these kingdom signs, People pay close attention, and there is, Scripture tells us, great joy in that city. The good news of Jesus Christ and the powerful name of Jesus Christ see great joy, and many are baptized in that city. But this, though it caused great joy in Samaria, might have come as an unpleasant surprise to some in the early church. Because Samaritans were not much loved by Jews. Remember that story that Jesus told which so challenged its hearers, the good Samaritan, which surprised Jesus' hearers because it was a Samaritan who was praised as good by Jesus for loving his neighbor, not the religious leaders who failed to act. Now in the early church, many from a Jewish background, many still harboring those deep-seated suspicions against the Samaritans, now they are being challenged to see that the good news of Jesus is for everyone. The family of God can include even a Samaritan who becomes a disciple of Jesus. And it's if to make sure this great, great truth was fully grasped, the Holy Spirit doesn't fall on these new believers until Peter and John, as representatives and leaders of the early church, the Holy Spirit doesn't come until they arrive and lay hands on these new believers. The Spirit doesn't fall on them when they initially come to faith and are baptized. And the Spirit doesn't come, not because they needed a second baptism, not because they needed to do anything else, not because they needed to perfect their faith or earn the gift of the Spirit. No, the Spirit doesn't come at the moment of their conversion because this is how God shows us how He is at work in Samaria. This is how gracious our God is. He accommodates us in our weakness, in our brokenness, in our failure. Our God accommodates us in our imperfect humanity. Think of the whole story of Jesus. God accommodates us by coming to earth in Jesus as a man. Think of how Jesus accommodates his disciples, inviting Thomas, who doubted, to touch his wounds to prove that he was truly and bodily risen. And look at how God accommodates people here, gathering the apostles before sending the Spirit so that word could ring out throughout the early church that the Spirit-filled family of God had grown, grown even to include the life of the Samaritans. God accommodates us in the work of his kingdom so that, in this gracious working, our hearts can be bent towards the very same kingdom. While this, then, is the big picture in Samaria, Scripture also invites us to zoom in and to see how God is at work in the life of an individual, a man named Simon. In Acts chapter 8, we see God at work in Simon's life. 
Simon had been practicing sorcery in Samaria. He was boasting that he was someone great. He was gaining for himself lots of attention, and he was becoming known as the great power of God, which I think we can all agree is quite the nickname. Simon, great power of God, but his power is empty. His greatness is meaningless, and all that he does is only an illusion. So then, the kingdom of God breaks into Samaria. The power of God works in Samaria. The greatness of God is proclaimed in Samaria, and people begin to lose attention in Simon, and instead shift their attention towards the truth of the gospel. Scripture tells us that Simon himself comes to faith in this great saviour Philip proclaims. But when the Spirit comes on these new believers in Samaria following the laying on of hands of Peter and John, then we see that Simon hadn't yet grasped the fullness of the gospel. God still needed to do a work in Simon's heart. He still wants power. He still thinks he can buy power. Maybe he thinks that if he has this gift of being able to impart the Holy Spirit, then maybe he could keep that old nickname, Great Power of God. We see in Simon a clash of worldviews, and it shows us how our deeply held worldliness can be, even in our own hearts, even when we have come to faith in Jesus. Simon brings his old worldview to his new faith. He sees the good gifts of the kingdom through the lens of his worldliness. And this is rightly and bluntly challenged by Peter, who tells him to repent, to pray and hope of forgiveness, to seek freedom from bitterness and captivity to sin. These are the habits of Christians living in the now and not yet kingdom of God. The gospel always challenges the way of the world the values of the world, and always offers to us instead the beautiful and alternative culture of the kingdom, the fullness of life found in following King Jesus. As we read from Acts today, we receive this postcard from the early church, not just as a record of of something that once happened, but as something which impacts us and speaks to us as the church of Jesus today. God wants to work in us. And his word challenges us by his spirit and leaves us with at least a few points of application to apply to our own church family and in our own personal discipleship today. The first is, if we know that God was at work in Samaria, then are we ready for God to invite Samaritans into our midst? Or at least the equivalent for us of Samaritans today. Are we prepared in our hearts to receive and to welcome those who are not like us. Those we may even at one time have considered enemies, as the Jews once committed, considered the Samaritans. This challenges any of those deeply held isms that sometimes can capture our hearts without us even realizing racism, classism, any prejudice of any kind. This also challenges our personal preferences, too, because there are always going to be people that we just don't particularly get on with. There are going to be people that we find more difficult than others. There are going to be some who even have a different preferred style of worship than we do. Scripture today searches our hearts and asks us if we are ready, if we are prepared in our hearts to welcome into our church family those who look and live differently to us. Those from backgrounds we don't share, and even those we just don't really get on with. And all because of the great truth that Jesus welcomes everyone to come to him, to have faith in him, to be transformed to look more and more like him, and in and through him to be united as one family, brothers and sisters, even people who were once enemies, now called brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We are called as God's people and God's people here in Banbridge and St. Patrick to reflect the welcome and the hospitality of the Lord Jesus so that many more might come into his kingdom. The second point of application for us to think about is an invitation to examine our hearts before the Lord and ask ourselves if we are still like Simon. Or maybe better put, in what ways are we still like Simon? 
because our worldview is never fully aligned with the kingdom and we always have more that God can do in and through us. It took a rebuke from Peter for Simon's eyes to be opened to the way in which his power-grabbing and fame-seeking worldview could be reshaped and beautifully put by the open-handed, grace-filled, humble, and beautiful way of the kingdom of God. Simon's worldview is what C.S. Lewis meant when he told us that we are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis said that our desires are too small, that we are half-hearted preachers, that we obsess too much over small desires and small ambitions, and we miss out on something beautiful that is freely offered to us. Because Jesus, says C.S. Lewis, he offers us infinite joy. Scripture invites us to have our worldly desires exchanged. All those things that far too easily please us exchanged for the infinite joy that is found in desiring most the kingdom of God through friendship with Jesus. And Peter helps us. He tells us how to posture ourselves in order that we might grow as disciples of Christ, in order that we might become wholehearted citizens of God's kingdom, in order that we might become effective sharers and partakers in this kingdom and in this kingdom work. Peter says it starts with repentance, changing direction, turning around and turning towards the life-giving path set for us by Jesus. It continues in prayer, seeking forgiveness, freedom from captivity to sin, seeking a right heart before God, and seeking always God's vision for us. Seeking a kingdom perspective formed by the Word of God, guided by the Spirit of God, which teaches us to see and do things according to God's way. Finally, and we will see this again and again as we journey through the book of Acts, Scripture reminds us that God works, God still works, and we should expect God to be at work today. The Spirit God gave to His people is the same Spirit dwelling within you and me, working in us, empowering and equipping us, working around us and in our world, falling afresh on people, changing and transforming lives, and all for the greater glory of the Lord Jesus. So today, let's begin to boldly pray for more. Let's begin to ask God to do more in our time. Let's work and serve and share the good news of the name of Jesus with the confidence that God is already at work, that his kingdom is coming, so that in our time and to the glory of Jesus, there would be much joy in the Lord, in Bambridge and in St. Patrick. Amen. respond to God's word and worship as we sing or offer to him one gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer.
just go straight to this side chapel at the end of the service. There's tea and coffee over in the hall, and we'd love to enjoy fellowship with you over refreshments. And there's a gift of leave church for all the men in church today as we celebrate Father's Day and give thanks for you all. So there's a verse card which says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. And as if that isn't food enough, there's also chocolate. Um, so men, don't leave church today um, without getting both of those things. Um, can I also say a massive thank you to our Inspire Band. Can we give them a round of applause for way of encouragement? And now, as we go out into the world as the people of God, we go with God's blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore.